later, then you can see them. But, uh, so thankful that they could be here with us this morning. I'd like you to take your Bible, if you will, and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter number 1 and verse 23. Once you've found that, I have you stand as we read from God's word this morning. Philippians chapter number 1, verse 23. Be reading verses 23 and verse 24. Philippians chapter number 1, verse 23. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we could come together this morning and open up your word. I pray that you'll do what I cannot do, and that is to speak to hearts once again. We are so grateful for each one that has come today, and I pray that your will be accomplished in the heart of every individual. Father, we desire your presence here with us today, and pray that, Father, when we leave, we'll know that we've met with you. And if there's one here, perhaps today, that does not know you as Savior, I pray that you would challenge their heart, break down the barrier, melt the resistance, that they might, too, become a trophy of the Lord Jesus Christ as they yield their life to you. Now, as we go into this service, I pray that your will will be accomplished, that you would be glorified through everything that is said and everything that is done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. As we see here, as the Apostle Paul is addressing the people in Philippi, he says, for I am in a strait betwixt two. You know, it reminds me of going back, oh, several hundred centuries prior to that, when uh, the prophet Elijah uh, addressed the children of Israel. He's on his way up to Mount Carmel. He's challenging the prophets of Baal. 450 prophets of Baal are going to be coming, and they're going to be uh, trying to show and flex their muscles and what their God Baal can do. And Elijah is going to say, but look what I can do uh, by just trusting in my God. And then we see a great victory is wrought, and, uh, and God has done a lot of uh, miracles for Elijah up to this point. But now we see the children of Israel coming, and well, if you had been on Mount Carmel that day, you would have seen dust clouds rising from every quarter as he came to see the contest that was about to happen. The problem is they were in a place of indecision, a valley of indecision, if you please, for they were afraid of what might happen if they show their allegiance to God. And Elijah looks at the children of Israel and says, how long halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, then follow him. If Baal be God, then follow him. The Bible says they answered him not a word. Why? I think they are afraid to show their allegiance with Elijah because he's far outnumbered. I think that they're waiting to see what's going to happen in this contest and see who's going to win before they throw their cards in to see who, who they might follow. But we find that they are watching out of curiosity. But Elijah says, how long halt you between two opinions? The apostle Paul says to us here, for I am a straight between, uh, betwixt two um, it's interesting, you know, uh, I've been in, uh, in that kind of a strait before too. You know, I mentioned before in, in the desert in uh, Arizona, walking my horse out onto a skin of uh, uh, lava with a, a fissure below it and uh, uh, wishing I was somewhere else in Philadelphia. Uh, you know, and I found the same thing, you know, I was um, on the side of a mountain in British Columbia riding my horse up the edge of the mountain. My sister is riding a horse behind me and we were, well, we were on a maybe a four-foot wide trail. And as we continue riding up and up and up, uh, the trail get narrower and narrower pretty soon. I mean, to start with, you could have drove an ATV up there, but by the time we got closer to the top, it was getting very narrow. It was only two feet wide. And, and, and then it began to get narrower and narrower, finally to the point where I couldn't turn around. The, the trail was only about 10 inches to 12 inches wide. And we were 500 feet high looking down a sheer cliff. And uh, uh, I was thinking to myself, I wish I was in Philadelphia again. And, uh, and my sister's behind me. She said, are we in trouble? And I didn't want to say yes, no, or not. And, and I said, oh, no. <laughs> and, and so I asked my horse to do the uncommon, that is to put uh, his head down. And then I slid over top of his head because I couldn't get off to the right side. That's the cliff. Couldn't get off the other side. That's the side of the mountain. There was no more room. And uh, slid off the front and was able to go up and do some scouting, turn my horse around, and then gently back hers down uh, the hill or the mountainside, uh, thinking uh, I was kind of 
in a straight betwixt two. You keep going forward, oh, we're backwards. So glad I chose the right direction. You know, we've been blessed here at North Country Baptist Church. In about three and a half months, we're going to be celebrating um, our 24th anniversary. Now, I know I don't look old enough to have been preaching for 24 years. Mrs. Mrs. Crow, some of them are laughing. <laughs> I have feelings too, you know. <laughs> but what a blessing. God has blessed time and time over these years. You know, I calculate I've, I've preached somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,500 sermons over these last 24 years. Uh, one of the things that amazes me, I just never cease to marvel, is the inexhaustibleness of God's Word. It, you never run out of soap when you're looking at God's Word. It's amazing. You stop and think of the, uh, how many were here um, you know, for every service over this last while. And not only did you come, how many times? And, and, and not only did you come, but you stayed for a long time, too. You, you stayed for the, the whole hour for our service, sometimes an hour and a half. And then we have coffee or refreshments together at the back. And, and now, you know, we've got a beautiful building that God has given to us. And some of you come so often, you've requested us to have a dormitory area for you to stay. Uh, sometimes, once in a while, I'll preach long. It happens, uh, and I'll maybe focus on every sin in the Bible, and, you know, it seems like it, it's forever, and some of you are thinking, come on, preacher, i got a roast in the oven. Or maybe, come on, preacher, my wife's got the potato salad ready for us at home. Um, but you stayed. Yep. And you know the thing about it, um, every week, all we have here is a book review. Every Sunday morning, we have a book review. Every Sunday night, we have a book review. Every midweek, you know, it's a book review. Every time we come, we just open up the same book. The same old book, the same book, God's Word. You know, every time we come, we just open up the same book. There's no pictures in it. You know, there's no picture on the cover for you to see. And the same book I've preached for for 24 years, the same book I've studied for 57 years since I was in uh, uh, Boys Brigade in Emmanuel Baptist Church in, in Barrie uh, when I was just 12 years old, almost every new preacher has this one thought come to their mind when they're starting into their ministry. What happens when I preach through this book? What then? You know, but you never do. You never can. It is inexhaustible. It is an amazing book. Why? It's a living word of God. Uh, of course, you can never preach the whole Bible through in one lifetime. It's impossible to do that. You know, I, I preach one verse, and then while I'm preparing my message, you know, uh, in my office, another minister, uh, you know, uh, uh, message comes to mind, and I can get two out of the same verse, or four, or ten. It's just inexhaustible. This book is for you. God gave it for you to have, not just for the preacher to get a message out to, to preach from, but for you to take home, for you to take and live in it, read it every day. And by the way, you need it. You know, um, it's amazing when you stop and think about it. The, the verses of God are new every morning. They are fresh every morning. The word of God is fresh, just like manna came to the children of Israel when they were in the desert every day. You need it. It's your sustenance. It's your nutrition for your Christian living. It's still, by the way, if you didn't know this, the number one selling book around the world is the Bible. Has been for centuries. You know, another amazing thing is I've been preaching, well, 3,500 times out of this book, um, uh, but I'm preaching about somebody I've never seen. It's by faith. It's just when you got saved, you got saved by faith. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, but you didn't see him. You, 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 didn't, you didn't have him before you. Uh, you didn't have the blessings that perhaps uh, people 2,000 years had when uh, Lord Jesus Christ came down, God came down in the flesh. We haven't been able to do that. But it's amazing. You keep coming, and I keep preaching, and God keeps blessing. You know, Oswald J. Smith, he was the... Uh, uh, preacher of um, People's Baptist Church down in Toronto, probably did more for Faith Promise Missions than anybody else did um, in promoting Faith Promise Missions amongst his people. And that spread the, the purpose and the uh, aspect of Faith Promise went around the globe and is used in many, many churches today. And he said he had preached, well, in, during his ministry about 60 years and somewhere around 12,000 times from God's Word and never came to the end of it. 
What an amazing thing it would be to go to heaven and see our Lord Jesus Christ face to face one day, the one that we've been preaching about and the one we've been listening about for all these centuries. You know, um, it would be worth it all when we see Jesus. Isn't that a, a hymn that we sing? Life's trials will soon be small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Paul was that way. Paul was uh, talking to the church of Philippi, and he is incarcerated. Uh, he's been sequestered. He's in jail. Uh, and, and he's writing a letter, and likely he was uh, chained between two prisoners here. Uh, just for illustration purposes, I need some help. Willie, can you help me this morning? Uh, let's see. Jeremy, can you help me this morning? So here's Paul, and he's in prison. He's got... Um, one prisoner here on this side and another one on this side. Willie will be one. Jeremy will be the other one. And they're in the same cell. Over here, Jeremy. So Paul is in between the two. What's he in jail for? Preaching the gospel. Well, what are these guys in jail for? Murder? I don't know. <laughs> Theft? Burglary? <laughs> uh, but he's in between two criminals. And he says, I'm in a strait between, or betwixt, two. It's kind of like this. He's writing to people in Philippi, and he's chained up between this guy and this guy. Now, he's wanting to write a letter. And he says, I'm caught betwixt two things. This guy's snoring and falling asleep and turning over, and he starts pulling on the chain. And so he, <laughs> and pretty soon he's snoring and pulling on the chain, or he's stretching, and Paul's trying to write, and he gets his big pen out, and, uh, and he's trying to write, and then all of a sudden this guy pulls on the chain, and, and this guy's trying to scratch his, his eyebrow, and he, he's trying to, he says, I'm caught betwixt two. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and I said, how many of you have found it that when time and time again you found yourself between a decision to make and you can't come up with the right choice, the right decision? Paul says, I'm in a strait right now. I'm betwixt two situations. That's what Elijah was saying. How long halt you between two opinions? If God be God, follow him. If Baal be God, follow him. Question this morning, who are you following? Question this morning. Have you yielded everything you are to God? He loves you. He wants you. you know? uh, Paul's chained between two prisoners. He's there in Rome. And as he's trying to write to Philippi, he says, for I am in a strait betwixt two. Now, I think he uses the illustration of being between two criminals for us to see a truth out of God's word that he's going to write for us. I think he may have been using the change, um, the pull of one direction to the other uh, direction to illustrate where he was in his spirit, how he felt in his heart. Perhaps one change pulled in one direction, another in the other direction. I think Paul may have used this as an object lesson for us to understand. He says, I am in a strait betwixt two. You see, there are two things spiritually that are tugging at Paul's heart. It's not the change. It's a spiritual battle within his own life. Paul says, on this side is Jesus. On this side uh, are, are God's people. He says, I'm caught between a twix between the two. Paul says, I want to go to both places. I want to be in both places at the same time. Paul says, I want to see Jesus. And who doesn't? I mean, if you're a born-again Christian, that's heaven. Amen. Uh, and I want to go, uh, go see Jesus, yet at the same time, it's more needful for me to be here, to stay here with you. Paul says this, I need to catch your tears. I need to help the poor. Paul says, ah, I need to show you how to grow in grace and become stronger in your faith. Paul says, I, I, I need to be here to teach uh, you uh, God's word so that you will understand. I need to be here to counsel you when you need help. Now, I want you to notice two things this morning. Number one, which is better, number one, and secondly, which is more needful. Paul wants to be in heaven with Jesus. Paul said, now for me to see Jesus is far better. <laughs> you know, uh, this is um, a play of the Greek 
language here. It says far more better or preferable better. Um, you know what that means. Uh, uh, that's um, not proper grammar uh, when it comes to English. Um, to say far more better is what a double negative, or uh, uh, actually in this case, a double positive. And, and Paul is saying, you know, I would rather be in heaven with Jesus, but at the same time, I want to be with you to help you. So if you have a double positive in the Greek language, what does that mean? Um, What do you do with that? I mean, what do you call that? You call that intensification. Uh, I know that's a big word, intensification, and I'm going to preach this morning a little bit on intensification, uh, but far more better, if you please. Um, Now, that's not good grammar. I know that, but um, please don't say anything to me after the service about me having bad grammar, or I might be uh, offended because I had the best grammar anybody could have. She was a wonderful lady. Um, but we can say far more better, uh, but not far more better, or far better, or better than. Uh, in the Greek, when they want to underscore something, they want to intensify it, um, or make it really intense, if you please, uh, stressing it, uh, they would use more than, you know, one positive before the subject or one negative before the subject, depending on what the case may be. This same is true uh, in the negative. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Look at Hebrew 3, 5, or 13, 5. Hebrew 13, 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What a blessing. (laughs) Um, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What it really is saying, no, I will not never, 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 never leave thee. It's an intensification. Nor will I never, never, never forsake thee. You know, you have five negatives in that one verse. No, that's bad English, but it's good Greek. It's called intensification. Now, uh, everybody knows you don't say, I have not got nothing. I mean, that wouldn't be proper English. Um, uh, Poor English, but a Jew who is, uh, you know, if he was busted and down and out, uh, he would say in intensification, I ain't got anything. Uh, It's kind of like when you say, well, I don't have any money. What you're saying is, I ain't got nothing at all. Nothing no more than you had yesterday. I don't have anything. We say, I have nothing. Simple and plain in English language. Or I haven't anything. We don't use uh, double negatives and double positives as a, uh, in, in English language as it was go. Our Lord said, I want to tell you something, and I'm not going to leave you. I want you to understand it. I'm going to be with you. And so it's an intensification so we can understand and grasp that. And so he said, I'm not never, never, not ever going to leave thee, nor ever, never, never forsake thee. He says, I will not never, no never, never forsake thee, never, 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 never. Jesus wants us to know he's not going to forsake us. He's going to be with us. If you've trusted him as your Savior, he loves you. He cares for you today. Paul said, I want to be with Jesus. He didn't say, I'd rather be. He said, I'd far more rather be or I'd far more preferable be with Jesus. He's saying, I really want to be with Jesus. That's the biggest thing I want for myself. If I could ask for something for myself, uh, uh, Paul is saying, it would be to be with Jesus today. You notice what Paul didn't say. Why didn't he say, angels are pulling me on one side, you know, and, 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 and then loved ones in heaven are pulling me on one side, or the golden streets up there in heaven are pulling me on one side, or the angelic choirs that would be so beautiful are pulling me on one side, no sicknesses being there, that's pulling me to one side, or no sin in heaven, that's pulling me on one side, or no temptation in heaven, that's pulling me on one side, or no pain anymore, that's pulling me on one side, that's not what he said. He said, not one word about his loved ones and seeing them in heaven. Not one word about no more sickness and no more pain and no more death, no crying, no sorrow, no heartache, no disease, and no temptation. He said nothing about that. Why? Because to Paul, heaven was one thing and one thing of importance, and that was Jesus. The most important thing for you and for me when we go to heaven will be seeing our Savior face to face there in heaven. 
Did you ever wonder why there is so little said in the Bible about heaven? I mean, there, there is not as much as I would like to see. Um, it, that's a striking thing to me about the Bible. Now, if I had wrote the Bible, I would have written all kinds of things. I would have included, well, you know, maybe something about the geography, the landscape, the colors, the visible stuff, you know, like the, the river of life, the details. I'd include uh, all the things um, about the folks that are up there because I have questions, just like you. Where's my sister uh, who died as just a, 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 an infant at sick kids in Toronto before I was even born? Where's my mom and dad? What's it like there? What are they doing there? Uh, where is my Uncle Jack and Aunt Dot right now? They've already gone on to heaven. Wh wh what's it like? What kind of a place is it? Um, I'm just that kind of a person. I like to know, well, when I was uh, floating down the, um, the Missouri River uh, one time in, in, in a raft, my wife and I were on uh, raft, uh, the same route that Lewis and Clark had used. We camped in the same campsites as those guys. And, and there was all kinds of information about it. Uh, and they had recorded all kinds of things about what they could see, the wildlife and the, the, uh, everything around them as far as the beauty, the, the uh, mountains in the far distance. Um, but I think our Lord wanted us to get wrapped up in him and not in the other things of heaven. Because that's what heaven is all about. It's about Jesus Christ. He, Jesus Christ, is heaven for us. It's like a young lady that got married to her husband who was going to be a missionary in Hawaii. Tough job, huh? Um, uh, imagine uh, how hard it would be to go on deputation uh, to say, well, I'm going to go be a missionary in Hawaii. Good night. That guy ought to be sending us money, not us sending money to him. Um, uh, but anyway, the time came for the young man to go to Hawaii. That's where God had called him. Later on, he sent for his wife to join him. And, and, and so she said to her friends that were around him, guess where I'm going next week? Her friend said, well, where? W where are you planning to go? She said, I'm going to be with my husband. She didn't say one word about going to Hawaii. She said, I'm going to be with my husband. She never mentioned the beaches. She never mentioned the coconuts. She never mentioned the palm trees. She never mentioned the pineapple trees. Or Well, they're not really trees. They're shrubs. I found that out in Cambodia. I thought they were trees, but they're not. Uh, she never mentioned anything about the ocean views or the sunsets. She never mentioned anything about the tropics, the beautiful flowers. She never mentioned anything about Waikiki or, or Honolulu or anything like that. She said, I'm going to be with my husband. She didn't care if it was... China, Pakistan, India, Cambodia, Philippines, as long as he was there, that's where she wanted to be. That's what Paul's saying. I'd far sooner be in heaven with Jesus. You know, question. We could say, Paul, why don't you describe to us what it's like? Tell us what heaven is all about. Paul said, it's like this. Heaven is Jesus. Question. Why don't you tell us about the golden streets, Paul? <laughs> He said, I won't even notice the streets when I get there because I'll be focused on Jesus. Well, Paul, tell us what, what, what the climate and the, and the temperature is going to be like there. Is it going to be like uh, the tropics? What's it going to be like, Paul? He says, ah, never even noticed that. All I know is that it's going to be perfect because Jesus is there. Well, Paul, what about the, the houses people live in? Well, I don't know. It doesn't really matter because Jesus is there. And so Paul said, I feel something tugging at my heart. One part of me wants to go to heaven to be with Jesus. The other part is, is requiring me to be here with you. He said, I want to be here. I feel obligated to be here with you. I want to be with Christ, but I want to be with you also. Um, that's why the Lord didn't include many details about heaven. He wants us to be consumed with the idea that he is there, wrapped up in the fact that Jesus is there. Augustine said this, just to know Jesus, just to know Christ, just to know Jesus, it would be enough. See, the Lord wants us to be occupied with him. No poverty there. Hmm. I know what Paul um, doesn't meant, you know, he mentions uh, very little of, of these things, no sickness there in heaven. Um, Paul had an eye problem. Uh, he, I don't know if it was a blindness or whether it was a, a stigma of the eye, whatever it was. He, had a, uh, he suffered because of an eye situation. But he never mentions that as going to heaven so that he could have his sight restored and see perfectly. That's not what's concerning him. He wants to go to heaven because that's where Jesus is. 
He was so occupied, concerned about seeing Jesus, those other things are secondary. So then second, um, but then Paul says there is more. There's something else. There's something more needful. Paul says, as for me, I am concerned. I want to go to heaven. I want to see Jesus, but there's something more needful. Paul said, you need me. I want to see you grow up. I want to see your families grow up. I want to see you get stronger spiritually. I want to answer your questions regarding God and his word. I want to help you along. It's needful for me that I stay here. I far sooner go to heaven, but it's needful for me to stay here. You see, God has a purpose to keep you here or else you'd already be in heaven. I know you want to go there and see your loved ones. You want to see uh, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But God chose not to take you to heaven right away because he has a purpose for you here. He has a plan for you. Find that plan. Find that purpose and do it. Yeah, consider for a moment. Uh, here's a beggar woman. Uh, and, and she has a little baby. She doesn't have anything to eat. Um, she hasn't eaten in quite a while. And she comes to uh, a, a place as she's walking by. They have a big feast going on there. And someone says, hey, please come in. Perhaps she says, oh, oh I'd love to. <laughs> and perhaps she begins to enter in, but then somebody stops her. And says, oh, you'll have to leave the baby outside. Uh, well, she wants the food. She's hungry. Uh, and she's dying for food, but she wants the baby. And she has a desire to eat, but... She won't leave the baby by itself. She, de she desires to survive. She wants the food, but she won't leave the baby. Paul said, I have a desire to go to heaven and feast and enjoy all the blessings of heaven. I want to see Jesus, but when I stop and think of it, you need me. You need me. Paul said, I, I want to see Jesus. Then Paul thought, what will you do without me? Paul said, there's one thing that is needful. You need me here. It's like a husband who goes away on a business trip. You know, in a few days, he calls his wife because he misses his wife. And he has, you know, uh, do you think you could come and join me on this trip? The wife says, uh, well, who, who, who are we going to have here to care for the baby? And, and so what happens? She joins him on his business trip, and she has one of the relatives take care of the baby. But she's so worried about the baby, she doesn't even think about the trip being with her husband. She's always phoning back. How is the baby? How is he doing? Is he eating? Is he feeling okay? Is he sick? Uh, that's what Paul said. I want to go to heaven, but I'm more needful here. There's something inside me that wants to stay here and be with you. Maybe the mom says, Oh, how's the baby doing? <laughs> Paul says, how's the church? How's Philippi? How, how are the saints doing? Uh, uh, how are the new converts doing right now? How, how are they, are they going to make it if, if I go to heaven? Paul says, I want to go to heaven, but you need me here yet for a little while. I want to be with Christ, but that's far more better for me. But he said, for you, it's more needful for me to be here. God has a plan for you, and it's far more needful for you to be here than heaven today. I know you want to go to heaven. I do too. But God has a plan for you. Find that plan and do it. God, God says there's something I've got already in store for you if you'll just follow me, Paul said. The pull here is to be saved. But the pull to stay and help, oh, it is so great. <laughs> but Paul got to the place where God wants you to get to today. Paul got to the place where he said, yeah, I want to go to heaven, but far more needful for me to be here, and so I'll find what God wants me to do, and I will do it. Paul said, I just as soon do one as the other. One will be a blessing to go to heaven, the other to be a blessing with you. Friend, you will never do God's will until you lose your own will. You will discover, if you yield your will to God's will, you will be able to enjoy the abundant life that he has promised you in his word. A Christian ought to say, where he leads me, I will follow, you know. Now, where he leads me is where I will go. No matter what the hardships will be, where he leads me, I will follow. Maybe it'll be the jungles of Africa, I don't know, or the deserts of Arabia, or the poverty of India, or the freezing and cold of the Arctic, or the go to the headhunters in Papua New Guinea, Guinea or, 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 or my much, much worse, Vancouver. And imagine if God should call you, uh, would you go? Would you respond to him today? If God called you to missions, he may call you to places of great beauty. 
<laughs> like Hawaii, who knows? Or maybe to Montana or Colorado, that'd be where I would like to be at times. Well, Hawaii, Ontario, the Alps, doesn't matter as long as he's there, as long as God's there, as long as the Lord is with you. <laughs> that's the best place for you to be. Did you ever stop and think about this? Paul went to so many places on his missionary journeys, and yet he never describes them for us. You know, think of Paul's journeys. You, you check your Bible. Um, you know, try and find Paul saying, well, I went to Troy. <laughs> uh, you know, I saw a beautiful lake. And on the lake, I mean, geesh, my, and, and ducks were there and, and, and all these beautiful birds um, and otters. And we saw them in the water. Paul didn't seem to notice the scenery. And if he did, it didn't seem to matter to him. Paul didn't take the time to describe the beauty of all the places he traveled. Why? Because Paul said, just to be what he wants me to be is far more important. Just for me to be active in doing what God has called me to do is what really matters. If he wants to take me to heaven, oh, that's so good. That's far more better, he says. But if he wants me to remain on earth, that's okay too. Just show me what you want me to do. i just as soon do one as the other, Paul says, but how about you? When you think of heaven and leaving behind all the trials and troubles and heartaches of this old world, is there a pull there? And yet God says, that's wonderful, but it's far more needful for you to be here right now. There's a story about a little boy who was acting up and his mother came into the room. And, and his mom said, son, behave yourself. <laughs> the boy looked at him and said, I will for nickel. And, and, and the mother said, a nickel? I said, yeah, I'll be good for nickel. His mom looked at him sternly and said, no, you will not. You will be just like your dad, good for nothing. <laughs> Paul said, there are only two places I want to live. I want to be with Christ. Now listen carefully. If I can't be with Christ, I want to be needful to you. That should be your heart's desire for the ministry God has called you to. Say, but God hasn't called me to be a preacher. I didn't say you were called to be a preacher. God has a ministry for you. Every person in this room is a missionary. I was, this week, I was at... Uh, uh, in Orangeville, uh, preaching to a bunch of kids and, and uh, explaining to them what a missionary is all about. I said, what does one look like? What do they do? What do they eat? I said, look in the mirror. There's one right there. Every one of us needs to be a missionary. Paul said, if I can't be with Jesus, I, 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 I want the fact that I am here to be worthwhile. I want it to count for something. Friend, how about you today? Can you say, I am more needful here than in heaven today? Are you fulfilling that which God wants you to do, what he wants you to be? You know, there are family members there in heaven. Yeah, I know that. There are church members there in heaven. There are young people, and there are senior citizens that have gone in before you. But all those same people groups are here too that are not in heaven yet. And it might be relying upon you to make the difference by sharing your testimony with somebody else, giving somebody a track, telling them about heaven and telling them about Jesus Christ who loves them and gave his life that they might have life, that they might be able to go to heaven and have their sins forgiven. God has a purpose for you today. Are you fulfilling that purpose? Question, what are you amounting to today? Will the will of God you know, um, be clear for you? And if not, won't you seek it out and find it? And when you find it, won't you please do it? Do it. Do it. <laughs> find the work God has for you and just do it. Bathe yourself in it. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. God has a purpose and a plan for you, for we are his workmanship. We are created unto good works for him to accomplish his best good in your life and those around you. Why? God loves you, but he also loves the folks around you. God loves you because you're here in Canada, but he also loves the people over in Cambodia. He loves the people in other parts of the world. In every people group around the globe today, God loves all those people. And he loves their children as much as you love yours. What are we doing to promote the, uh, the worldwide evangelism to others? By helping our missionaries. You can see them as uh, 12 of them on the board at the back, uh, posted there, and we have their letters of what's going on, as well as our own ministries in Cambodia. What are we doing to promote 
worldwide evangelism. What does that mean? That is meaning sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around the globe. Yes, and around the block, in our own home, in our own family. You see, it's equally as important for you to be a missionary at home as for you to have been called to a far and distant land. The plan is God is perfect in his planning for you. And his plan is clear, if you'll just seek it. Find his will and do it. This morning, if you're here and you're not saved, I can tell you what his will is for you. He wants you to be saved. If you're listening this morning online, can I just tell you, God's plan for you is clear today. You say, I don't know what God's plan is for me. I know what it is. His plan is for you to be saved. He said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's you. For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's you. That's God's plan for you. That's step one. And after you've been saved, next step is to be baptized, making a proclamation that I'm not ashamed of what Jesus did for me. Step three is to join a church, get involved in serving God in whatever capacity he calls you to do. Won't you find his will? Because that's just the beginning. There is a whole world opportunity waiting for you today. If you'll just trust him, put your faith and trust in him 100%, and you will find you can enjoy the abundant Christian life he intended for you. That element people are searching for, peace, happiness, joy, can be yours today by simply shedding your own will and taking upon the will of God for your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us today. So grateful for your, each one that has come, and I pray that you'll bless in these next few closing moments. Father, we are thankful for your word, its power, its authority. We are indeed grateful for the fact that, God, you loved us so much, you sent your son Jesus Christ to die for us on the cross. We know we don't deserve anything, but you loved us that much that you would make that kind of a sacrifice for us that we could have our sins forgiven. Father, if there's one here today that's not saved, I pray the Holy Spirit of God will be prompting them today, melting down the resistance, breaking down the walls uh, of resistance, helping us to focus on the fact that we within ourselves can't go to heaven. It must be because someone has paid the penalty for our sin, and that someone is your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to be faithful now as we conclude this service. We love you today. And thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you are going to do as we seek to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take your hymn book and turn to